He's Karek. Nice to see you. Good to see you, my sister. And uh, just before you mentioned that you, uh, you, you jokingly mentioned that you go by Yamaji Maximus. I don't know if you're <laughs> sure enough. I loved it. It's a great name. <laughs> it, I just made that up in that moment. So oh, I don't, I definitely just, but hey, that also sounds cool too, you know, like yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, sounds for sure. So mm. Yamaji, is that, uh, what does that mean? So it's, well, it, in the West Coast, so we've got all these different clan names, right? And there's so many clan names. We've got like hundreds of different clan names. Um, so I'm calling from Noongar country, right? So Noongar being the southwest of Western Australia. There are 14 sub-clans. We'll call them sub-clans, which make up that Noongar nation. But if you go north, north of Noongar country, you ever heard of Geraldton? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Geraldton, that's on Yamaji country, right? So my mum... She grew up in a little town called Miningu, which is like east of Geraldton ish. And uh, that's Buddy Maya, but it's Buddy Maya Yamaji, Buddy Maya Yamaji Nunga. So that's what Yamaji is. Right. Makes sense? <laughs> yeah, it makes perfect sense. So, mm. uh, and we're talking about Australia, by the way. Uh, um, uh, is it Aboriginal still or is it Koori people? What, do, what, do we, what should we be saying? I have a whole training on like the words that we use it's like is it indigenous is oh, is it aboriginal or is it first nations or is it countrymen or is black fellow okay you know what i mean like what's the what's the words is that your question yeah absolutely yeah. first thing first thing to mention is that everybody has their preference right it, there's not there's not like the one word that we all use that everybody will adopt as the main thing right so in the a class of we'll call it terminology and the A class is Aboriginal, Indigenous, First Nations, countrymen, right? Aboriginal is to reference the Aboriginal people of the mainland of Australia. Torres Strait Islander is to reference the Aboriginal people of the Torres Straits, but they've claimed their own name because they are the Torres Strait Islanders, okay? Now, if I get Aboriginal and if I get Torres Strait Islander, and if I merge them together, we have two babies. One of them is Indigenous, and the newer baby, the younger one, is First Nations. They're the same terminology, the same meaning, but in reference to both Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Now, here's the thing is like, some aunties will say, no, I don't like Aboriginal. I like Indigenous, please refer to me as Indigenous. Some aunties might say, no, actually I like Indigenous. I don't, I, I don't wanna be referred to as Aboriginal. Indigenous resonates more with me. Some aunties say, I like First Nations. You know what I mean? So we kind of go around, but, the, but for the majority of us, like 99% of Aboriginal people, all will use in those ones interchangeably from my experience that makes sense now that's the a class but if i go to s class what's the most the ultimately appropriate terminology because see here's the thing most of these peoples they all they'll, they'll, they'll eventually get to this point where i'll go aboriginal indigenous first nations none of them because these are all terms that were given to us therefore the best thing you can refer to me as is my specific clan name. Yamaji, Nunga, Gadigal, Nyol Nyol, Badi, Yaru, Wurundjeri, whatever it is, because that's the traditional name, right? I mean, and they have their own languages and stuff. They are separate nations, right? Yeah, well, it's like, uh, that's also where it gets a bit difficult as well, because like Nunga country, for example, is one language, but it's got three different dialects in there. And you go up to Yamaji country, which is bordering on Noongar country. Some of those words from Noongar country is also in Yamaji language, but the Yamaji language has different words to describe different things. So we really, we really can't think about languages with borders, really, because a lot of them it's shared and a lot of it is interchangeable with each other. So when people say we have 263 different languages, it's like, well, some of those languages are just different dialects or some of those languages are specific languages. Like it's actually quite difficult to understand what we actually, because we're looking through the Western lens really, I find a lot of the time, whereas like a lot of these languages um, are, are either similar, same, same, but different or a different dialect, but same, but different. You know what I mean? It's, it gets a bit confusing. I think they're so ab uh, we're so abstract. Like we don't, we, and we have flowing things between us. We're not really categorized very easily. In that no, way. I mean, any language, not really. Look at its evolution. Like, we we probably split off from German ages ago. Like if you look at really old English, Latin, it's, yeah, a lot of Latin, tons of Latin. Yeah, it's um, ironic because Latin is actually the original word of Aboriginal and Indigenous. I believe is both the Latin terminology. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Technically, you can refer to other First Nations people as Aboriginal, but I, I think sure. Internationally, I think Aboriginal just means uh, Australian Aboriginals. But well, yeah. well, well. Actually, you're right. So, technically speaking, really, we should have started at the absolute basic, which is what is the definition of the word? Okay, and the definition of Indigenous just by the word without the context is somebody who is native to a space that was born there so technically by this definition you are indigenous everybody is indigenous to somewhere this is what i like to call the auntie pauline hansen lens of indigenous she does this and it's and she's being clever and she, she's not wrong she's just using she's been a little bit cheeky right so she'll say something like I am indigenous because I was born here. And now again, she is correct. She is correct by the definition of the word. She's deliberately taking out the context, which is, well, contextually, we know that that term has been adopted to describe contextually the Aboriginal peoples of the first peoples being here before you, Auntie Pauline, you see what I mean? So that's, that's sort of, yeah, like everybody is technically by the Latin definition of the term, yes, indigenous or Aboriginal to somewhere, right? Before, before we get any further, um, I should probably introduce you. So, uh, yeah, you oh, are, yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. You are an educator uh, and yep. in in Aboriginal culture, I suppose, and um, yep. and also an artist. And you have an Instagram. What's your what's your handle? It is the wholesome Yamaji, the underscore wholesome underscore Yamaji, Y A M for Mike A T J I, the wholesome Yamaji. That's me on Instagram. And it's great. You should check it out. He's got some cool stuff. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, it's it's interesting. I was I've had this conversation with a friend recently, and it seems as if we're from a Westerner's perspective. I, I think we don't understand that we are kind of swimming in our own Western culture that goes back to the Bible and the Greeks, and like we in in Christianity. I mean, it's we, we kind of in at least in Australia, we kind of swim in this Christian belief system, even if we even if we don't identify as Christian at all, like. Our values kind of come from that and when when pauline hansen i love that you call her clever by the way that's such a um that's such a nice way to talk to someone who you probably share very few values with in in this context i mean it's <laughs> such a nice way to talk about i don't want to say your enemy she's i'm sure she, she doesn't feel like an enemy to me but someone who's not quite yeah. with you. um yeah but what she doesn't understand i would say if i were to talk to her directly would be like aboriginal people uh, are swimming or they are maybe partially only swimming in their own culture like I, and and there's been this great disconnect with culture that's um probably the reason why there's so much trauma i would say and um and that's i think it's important to be restored i think that's maybe one of the most important things we can do is is um give the power back to the indigenous people is and and then also introduce the culture to westerners and and take the wonderful beautiful things in into account and and use them in our everyday society because lord knows we aren't perfect and we could use some more wisdom yeah i think so i just noticed that for some reason zoom just thought that i put my thumbs up so now you have a thumbs up emoji on me apparently but yeah it's <laughs> funny it's funny because yeah culture is an interesting word and i think people define culture differently and like some Australians think like that there there's that that Australia lacks culture, right? It's like, oh, I don't have any culture. But some Australians, they're like, yeah, Aussie culture. Like it's there's it's an interesting term that we use to describe our surroundings and our beliefs and our values that make us who we are today. Um, and when people say, Oh, you you teach culture, and I go, Yeah, I, I teach culture. Um, I don't actually usually describe it necessarily straight away as I teach Aboriginal culture. Rather, I say I teach people culture and I do this in an Australian forum and I do it through an Aboriginal perspective, right? That's sort of how I explain the culture that I teach in a sense that maybe you can feel like it's less about like, oh, I am learning about an external culture. Um, and you could, you could say that if you're looking through that lens, but I, I present it in a way where I go, the culture I'm teaching is sort of this inherent understanding of our connection to country and people and place through the Aboriginal perspective. You see what I mean? Yeah, of course, because any, any, the Aboriginal culture naturally will have wisdom in it that will apply to every single person. It's not just so. like wisdom and, and, and I, I guess wisdom doesn't just stay within a cultural boundary. Like if, if it's, if it's 
true wisdom, it can be kind of passed on to anyone, I would say. Yeah, I think so. I'd hope so, right? <laughs> yeah. What is it that you teach exactly when you go into a into a meeting room and, and educate people? What, what does it look like? It's a good question. Um, <laughs> I often ask myself the same thing because uh, it could look like it looks like a lot of different things. I, I run my own business. Um, I do what I want to do when I, whenever I want to do it, um, and I have just a bank of knowledge. Courage, and we say courage, and courage is knowledge, and it's it's not just knowledge. Um, for the Nungas, cart is your head, right? Jin is your feet, right? Now, karajan is like what it's saying to you is that it's knowledge, not just from your mind, but it's your experience. It's who you are. It's I bring that karajan to the forefront, right? Now, I can do this in a lot of different ways where I can code switch from, look, I, it could be uh, a, a local primary school might reach out and they say, hey, Reese, we want to learn about Aboriginal culture. And I'll go, cool, that's I can teach them Aboriginal culture. Um, who, who, who do you want me to teach to? Oh, we got year fours. I go, oh, okay, cool. Well, look, I, I've got some artifacts I can bring in. Uh, we can talk a little bit about language. I can tell a dreaming story maybe, you know. So I just uh, constructed around what that that client or those people are interested in. Or it could be teaching culture in the sense of like a, a business or an organization says, we have a reconciliation action plan and we're up to the innovate stage of that plan. Uh, and what we would like to do is incorporate uh, traditional cultural knowledge to the to the, the wider community and the we'd like to promote and we'd like to do you know and there's just different ways that people articulate what it is they're looking for but essentially uh, and then I can just come in and I go cool well I can now I'll present a training where I can provide a little bit of value as to um, how I can articulate or share the cultural cartagen that I understand and that I know that will hopefully um, in your bubble of culture will add value to it, right? So it's less about just learning about, oh, now I know about culture. So it's not cultural awareness. I'm not a cultural awareness trainer. I'm a cultural applicational trainer. I like to go, well, let's see if we can use some of this cultural cartogen that's really valuable to you as the individual. And then we can talk about it being valuable to your business or your, your image and everything like that, sure. But I'm more interested to how people can adopt the traditional cultural cartogen that we in this country have to offer. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, right now, uh, when we usually do an acknowledgement of country, it's, it seems to be something like um, we are, so at the beginning of a meeting or something, for anyone who doesn't know, at the beginning of a meeting, we might say, uh, I'm here to acknowledge the traditional elders of the land and like the, the Gadaga land and um, or wherever you are. And then you, elders past and present. And are you okay? Everything good? My mum just called me and it goes to Zoom and it shuts oh, okay. me down for a second. So I, I have to decline it. I'm sorry, mum. <laughs> sorry, continue. <laughs> yeah, if it's, we can always pause if it's, yeah. No, anyway. no, no. That's Very all right. I'll call it back. She's all right. <laughs> good, good, good. Um, and uh, and um, so um, what I kind of heard from you is that you, um, instead of kind of reciting these verses, which is good for, it's, it's good to acknowledge the owners of the land, but it doesn't exactly that that traditional way we we do it doesn't feel it to me like it gives us it doesn't give me something to take home and appreciate. <laughs> yeah, and, and so yep. it sounds like you're kind of giving people this gift of of, of maybe under understanding themselves a little bit better. Uh, well, that's yeah, that's that's. I mean, I I wouldn't say I'm giving any gifts. I would I would say that. Um, I'm providing context for you to be giving the gifts, if anything. Um, acknowledgements of country are funny because if, well, my first job, and I get it, like my first job was at the local high school and I was uh, the AIEO, which is the Aboriginal and Islander Education Officer, which was a support officer role for students. But I had also adopted the role to be the guy to say the acknowledgement and all the assemblies. And nobody gave me context, right? Nobody, nobody sits me down and goes, this is why we do it. This is how we connect to it. This is why it's meaningful. No, no, no. You just get the script. And the script is like, good morning, parents, teachers, students. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we stand a bunch of people among our nations, paper sex, the elders past and present. Thank you. And it's like, okay, that's just the words themselves. It's not like it's a bad thing. It's just, okay, it's a respectful thing to do. And there's respect in those words. And I'm sure people can connect to those words. Um, but yeah, we're all in this interesting position where, almost all the businesses and organizations and schools are implementing the process, 
but they've kind of done it without the context. Um, so I it's kind of come full circle now and I've gone, well, how do I provide the context to people that I know haven't given the context? Because I was never given the context. Like I'm not the expert. I'm just, I've just got the catagen, which is the experience and the knowledge more than just from up here. So how do I bring in maybe a bit of um, clarity to people going, well, why do we, why do we do this acknowledgement? You see what I mean? So that's sort of what I, why I teach specifically acknowledgements of country, but more, more so how to feel confident and comfortable in saying words that are actually kind of meaningful to you. And by extension, the acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of that country or that specific place that you are speaking from. Can yeah. you give us a little piece of, of what you teach to people? <laughs> well, um, I could I, I could talk about this for a long time, right? So it, it, what I what I would do is considering all of that. So considering that I'm very aware that just like me, you were never given the context to the acknowledgement of country. No, I go well. What is the Aboriginal concept of country? Very very generalized term, Aboriginal, because we've got lots of different mobs with lots of different laws and lots of different cartagen. So I go, what is a general theme of what? country is country i'm going to use in this context with a capital c and then i go okay now what is the western mind or the western understanding of what country is to westerners now to westerners little c country country is usually described as a geographical place just a geographical place right that country or like what you're looking out when you look out the window country it is what i see that's okay that's an accurate that's what country is now, for Aboriginal peoples, I could confidently say that the general concept of country to most, if not all, Aboriginal peoples is that it is a wearin. A wearin is what the Noongars call a spirit, meaning that it's actually alive, meaning that it is conscious, meaning that it is breathing, meaning that it is it has a language, it speaks, um, and it connects everything. Right? New Age people love this. But it's this idea that it's a it's it's a lie. Now I go, it's interesting. So if we're acknowledging country, I first go, hmm, are we acknowledging country as just geographical space? I like to I like to acknowledge country as if it is alive, as if it is a weird. That's what my elders are telling me, and I think there's some value and merit to that. So I have this thing where I go, well, if country is alive and it's listening to me, and if I am a part of it then automatically my engine, my mechanisms change because I'm coming from a place of like um, uh, real uh, intuition and power, knowing that there's, uh, it's, it's, it's more about the spirit as opposed to just geographical space. Because through the spirit of the country, we can also acknowledge the geographical space because that's important too, because it absolutely is geographical space. It's just a lot more than geographical space. So I know that's probably quite a lot there, but I, I just provide that bit of a context or, or um, perception of what country is. And then I encourage people, yourself, or I encourage any Australian that's doing an acknowledgement of country, just to take a moment to consider the words from that perspective. Consider the words and then go, first of all, is this actually meaningful to you? Is it meaningful for you to say? Um, unfortunately, some people get put into the position with their business or organization where it's like, we as a business have a rap plan where it says that you've got to do the acknowledgement of country. And that is the way that we show respect. But oftentimes you have a lot of employees that don't even know what they're acknowledging. They go acknowledging the what, the what, Wajak people of the, the Noongar nation and pay respects. And that seems to just be enough for people to go, all right, well, I'll say it because that means it's respectful. But I think a lot of the time people don't know why or how that could be a lot more respectful if you as the individual just spend like a little bit more time in maybe researching some of these words, some of these names and feeling a bit more connected to those words. Does that kind of make sense? That makes perfect sense, of course. Yeah. And um, I think there was a lot to unpack there. I, um, <laughs> what you said about spirit was really fascinating because I think in this sort of corporate world that we live in, although I, that's changing as well as corporations become more open and um, open to spirituality, but we're, we're very atheistic in this Western country. So it's, we don't, although I think a lot of people naturally might gravitate towards seeing the world as something that is, or the country that is something alive and that can hear you and, and speak to you. Mm. I think it's easy to be 
I, I know my I myself feel this. It's easy to feel worried that people will think you're crazy or yeah. Yeah, it's it's like actually a crazy point of view to to see the country is alive, although it definitely is alive. Like it's yeah. full of living things. It's constantly even if you just take it from an atheistic yeah. point of view, like it, of course it's alive. Everything's alive, and so yeah. um, there's there's somewhat of a clash. But I and then the second thing you said is uh, is is really interesting, and I like it a lot because for a long time I've I've had this sort of issue with this acknowledgement of country because I would say like, well, not say, but I would think uh, nobody's being helped here. We're acknowledging the elders, but we're just, I, what I see is people saying words and then they're just repeating what words they need to say. And then nobody is being helped. But then now it seems more like maybe that was the first step. Maybe that was the <laughs> step that we needed to get. And now there's people like you, and I'm sure many others coming and adding to that and now saying, oh, well, now let's, instead of just doing an acknowledgement of country, let's let's take a minute and appreciate the land around us and how it how it speaks to us and how it, it's it's living. Yeah. Can you can you look outside and and see the trees blowing in the wind and see how it you know how the how the land moves with itself. And yeah, yeah it, it seems more like now now the acknowledgement of country feels deep to me all of a sudden <laughs> after years yeah. of just being like why why are we doing this? Now it's like oh of course it makes Isn't that funny kind of a plan yeah it's funny that we just need just a little bit of context just a little bit just a small there you go that that helps apparently to so then then the, the, we can start there you know what i mean um it's not yeah it's a it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting thing that people do and look this it's the other interesting thing that you said it's like um, i understand that right it's like country alive like no that 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 conflicts with my value or my my belief or my culture and it's like, okay, well, look, if it helps you, like, I'm not a spiritual person necessarily. Like, I'm not, I don't think I really attach myself to an, any ideology or any belief. Um, but I am playing with this concept myself personally. And I'm playing with the concept of like, hmm, I'm just going to pretend that that's true. I'm going to pretend that country is actually alive and somehow in some metaphysical level, which I absolutely don't understand, that she can hear us and that she responds to us and I'm a part of it. I'm like, oh, that's pretty easy. I can, I can just play with that idea. And then I found really kind of recently that as I just play with that idea, it's kind of really just aligning with the actual words that I'm saying from the script and it provides value itself and it provides meaning. So I'm like, well, look, that on its own level is working. It works for me. And if it doesn't work for you, then look, then don't say the script then don't say things that aren't meaningful to you or that aren't purposeful to you you know what i mean that's sort of how i would consider it anyway of course it's so important to tell the truth and but i i feel the exact same way um i i've looked into religion at first from an atheistic lens and then as i got deeper into it it became more and more the spirituality became more and more alive for me i i yeah. but yeah if we want to approach it as an eight i think What's important here is that you can approach it as an atheist, as like like you said, like you can just pretend it's real and and just see if it resonates with you. And in a way, the country is alive anyway, so it's not like you need to stretch far. Um, yeah, my fear was like, oh, to to understand something spiritual means that I've got to go on like go on a spiritual journey or like become enlightened or like go through law business or, you know, become, and, and sure, like that would be pathways for many people that would, I'm sure, provide a lot of value. And I think that was where my fear was with that. But and then I just, again, as I said, I've just gone just for me as an individual and as a person and someone who is what, it, so I go, well, what is true? What is true with what I'm hearing? Everyone has a connection to country. That's true. No matter how you look at that, that's true. You could look at that from a communist position or a Christian position or a Muslim position or an Aboriginal position or a CEO position or as a kid. Everyone has a connection to country. That's beautiful. Start there. Country is alive. This is where you go, oh, what does that mean? I don't know what that means, but let's, let's roll with it because, hey, uh, there's something that all our elders are saying. Maybe there's, maybe there's some merit to that country is alive and I go well what does that mean I don't know what that means but let's let's now when I mean so if it's acknowledging country country being alive well in that case now there's some value that can come to that being that it's like it's listening to me so I just reframe it that way and naturally it seems to resonate so I go oh thank you old people thank you my elders actually 
I'm starting to get it. I'm starting to understand it. I don't have to be enlightened. You know, I don't have to go through all that business, law business, all that yet if I don't want to. But it's like what you've told me has provided immense value, immense value. And I'm like, cool. Now, can everybody do that? Because it's, it's fine value for me. Surely they can find value for you. Hmm. Yeah. There's a few things that you've said so far a couple of times. And I'm interested in, so it seems like um, elders are, are quite an important, play quite an important role. And I'm, I'm curious mm. as to what role they play. That's a very good question. Um, and this probably depends on the group that you're talking yeah. about. So <laughs> maybe this is very general, but in your culture, from what you know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm gonna, I, it's a general question, which I can provide a general answer, which is probably going to be good enough. Okay. Generally, <laughs> I actually reached out to one of my elders and, and I asked him a question about acknowledgement of country since we're sort of talking about that. And I was like, uncle, why, why do we acknowledge country? Like, why do we acknowledge elders? And also, how do you feel as an elder being acknowledged all the time? And why is elders important? And like I say in my training, like he pulls me aside and he goes, what you got to understand, right, Reese, is that everybody got elders. And I was like, yeah. And he goes, it doesn't matter who them elders are. It doesn't matter where they're from. And it doesn't matter what they did. But what does matter is that they have gotten you to where you are right now. And they've gotten me to where I am right now. Having this conversation in this moment. So for whatever it's worth, it's worth honoring that, that because we're here. And I'm like, okay, that's now everybody can connect to that because that's true. That's a true thing that he said. So I said, thank you. You know, so that is, that is what I guess the importance of elders is at least from the Aboriginal context, but it kind of extends to everybody's context because yeah. that's what he's saying is like, everybody's elders are everybody's elders and it's gotten us to where we are. Wow. Yeah. There's some, there are some things. So Sometimes people talk about spirituality and I can understand it from a conceptual point of view. It's like, it's kind of in my head and in my brain and I can understand it. But then there are some things that take you straight into the present moment. Like, like <laughs> immediately, I'm not thinking about anything else, but being very much centered in the present. And that was one of them. I mean, our elders brought us to this moment right now. Yeah. Hmm. No matter what Is that not worth acknowledging, right? That's like, I acknowledge the elders. Mm. Why? Because they got us here. Thank you. Yeah. This is important, you know? Mm. Yeah. Life. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> literally the reason why we are alive. <laughs> it's very important. Yeah. There was, and yeah. there was another thing you said. Um, you said that you mentioned, and I just kind of caught this. I'm not sure if, it, if you did it on purpose or something, but you said some aunties think that uh, indigenous, whatever. And you, you mentioned aunties twice. And I'm wondering if, if the women or specifically the women elders, I'm not sure, have have some sort of cultural, um, uh, I, I was wondering if they have a different place in the culture in terms of um, representing the culture or something like that. Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really, uh, I didn't uh, purposely say aunties in a specific context, but no, but, but, but yeah. Um, well, look, for all Aboriginal peoples in a traditional context, um, we had men's roles and we had women's roles. And I'm sure that sort of extends to, to every culture, right? Like there are men's roles and there are women's roles. Um, and it's almost very difficult to bring that up in such a progressive time now, because people seem to get a little bit upset at that concept. And, but I'm not talking about it from the men's roles and women's roles from a Western point of view, you know what I mean? Like that, that traditional Western point of view of men go to work all day and women go and stay in the kitchen. No, I'm talking about this from a traditional point of view. And it is important because our old people um, are still very sacred and uh, still hold very sacred beliefs and roles about where you should go, like where, where some only men go over this place, only women go over this place here. Um, you know, only men are supposed to be the ones that are to be constructing and creating certain tools and certain things, and only women are supposed to be doing that. And it's not in a sense to segregate, 
um, as I think a lot of people sort of automatically go to. Yeah. It's rather in a sense to understand your role as an individual around what that means to you, right? So it's like um, aunties in a sense, like some, some Aboriginal cultures were quite matriarchal in the sense of the aunties, the, the, the elders and those old people, the women that have a, a, a lot more women in those communities and B would have therefore most of the power, even though power is an interesting one, which you can't really quantify and segregate and intersectionalize. But at the same time, as it's been explained to me at least, that some of these clans were quite matriarchal, some of these clans were quite patriarchal, and they would work within each other's ecosystems to navigate those spaces. So in a patriarchal Aboriginal cultural society, it was often that the matriarchal society that would be next door, sometimes those women would be married into the clan of the patriarchal society because they had the more women and the more power of that place in that time it's very difficult for me to actually explain because I, to be honest i don't know it and it's one of those things which it's conversations that i've had and that i've gone oh this is interesting so now let me try to i don't know explain it in a way which makes sense to me at least yeah oh that makes sense yeah, yeah I, we um the gender roles make me laugh kind of and i i i should <laughs> talk sh too much shit about them but like the the whole the whole idea that like m when men and women are completely equal in every sense it's like okay well you know i guess people can take that that's fine but um yeah it is interesting if you look throughout history um we we have this conceptualization that women are have been oppressed in in so many ways and I'm, we have in different ways but mm -hmm. there are also many women who who had incredible power and just didn't wield it like a king would you know, o over like overtly, like I, mm. Alexander the Great's mother was incredibly powerful. She never had like a role in the court, but she raised Alexander the Great and counseled him, and you know, and yep. and his his father as well, Philip. And yep. I think women, we although feminism has been incredible for many of us, I think in in some regards. Um, it has taught us that we aren't as powerful as we really are. And I, I think that's, I think we could probably find a balance here somewhere. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's, I'm glad, I'm glad. Uh, yeah. Well, I think people, right? So I think, yeah, we, we, can, we can, we can, men and women and we can go sort of, we can provide any label, Aboriginal, non, and we can sort of deconstruct and, and, and talk about those. And they're all very important. And I, but I go, okay, well, what's, what are people doing? And just of what you're saying there, well, for me, it's like, I think people in general are all a lot more powerful than we think we actually are, mm. right? And, and in many cases, um, I think we all, regardless of the labels that we apply to ourselves or to others, um, we actually can do a lot. I think we kind of forget that we've, that we're actually really kind of, yeah. We're really kind of good but we're actually kind of we're actually quite powerful you know what i mean and that power can be manifested in a very negative way or what i like to focus on it, it can actually be presented and manifested in a very creative and beautiful and meaningful way so i align myself with that because that's what i'd like to see more of um and i think if we continue just more do more of that then then that is is that not the dream is that not what we should be aiming for you know I don't know. Are, you, are you in a manif I mean, do you, do you ever do the manifesting thing very often, like the writing down your goals or visualizing them or anything like that? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't write down goals. Um, I don't. Uh, it works for some people, right? It, like some people. Like I know people that you know they they're goal oriented and and they will get there, and it's like that works for you. Um, no, I don't necessarily. Um, visualize and manifest and 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 uh write things down rather i just do what i enjoy doing in the moment now which is the most fun thing to me right now right so that seems to have gotten me pretty far so so far so um that's what i do <laughs> i uh i notice i noticed that i so i i had this kind of epiphany the other day um I had written down my goals and I was doing this process where I would like visualize them and, and read them multiple times before I went to bed. And uh, dreams are super important for me. I, I think the brain when, when we sleep is, is just the mm. most powerful thing. And so, mm. and there were a few of them, but I, I would write down and I was especially manifesting like finding 
the love of my life. That was huge for me. And I was like, and it was, it got to the point where like, I would go on dates and then if I didn't, if, if a guy like goes to me or whatever, and even if I was upset, I would be like, oh, his higher self just knows that he's moving out of the way because I, I'm going to find the one, you know? And it's kind of, yep. I get it. But like, I found him and he's great. It's, it's the best relationship ever. It's amazing. And then I realized like, I was thinking the other day, like, why hasn't music taken off for me? And then I realized that like, oh, I haven't been manifesting it. Instead, I've been concentrating on what I've done wrong. And like, why, you know, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm getting older and I'm not making music enough and yeah. like all this different stuff. And it's like, oh, I, I just manifested that instead. Yes. Like <laughs> Yes. Yeah. In fact, and that's, and thank you for sharing that, right? And um, it's, that's very exciting to me. I think that um, uh, the, the, the two, what do they say? And it's one of those things that you hear and then you might, you might hear it in a TED talk or a thing. And it's one of those things that for me, I just forgot about. And now I'm actually kind of realizing the power behind it. The two most powerful words in the language, in at least the English language, is what? Do you know? You heard this one? No. The two most powerful words. I am. I am. Okay? Because whatever you say in your mind after those is what you are. When I do my drawing, so I do the art stuff as well, so many times... People will say to me, if I go into a classroom or if I'm just sharing my work, so many times people say to me something like, oh, that's so cool, Reese. Oh, that's awesome, man. Oh, I can't draw. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a creative person, you know, but I love that. And I go, look, I appreciate that. But they'll say that thing, I can't draw. And that's like, I go, okay, well, here's the thing. You can draw, but you just told yourself that you can't, right? You can draw, like you can, you can, <laughs> it is but you've, you've, you've created that blockage or that barrier because you've created the I am. You go, I am not a creative. I cannot draw. Okay, well, you just made that the reality. But let me humbly re-remind you, uh, you can, um, because I had that mentality before. And then I just started drawing things because it was enjoyable for me. Um, I never studied for it. I didn't go to uni. I didn't do the goal planning. Just, hey, it works for some people, not for me. I just drew things because I enjoyed it. And now it is a core component of my business because it was something I enjoy doing because I told myself that this is fun and I am good at this. And there you go. And some people are, I think, afraid of that. Some people are like, oh, but I don't, it's, it's scary for me. I'm like, yeah, it's scary. Like that's life, it's scary. But I mean, it doesn't mean that you, you, you can, you have to create your own personal barriers. So anyway, because you were saying that, I was like, oh, there's that I am there that I, I think is, uh, that resonates quite well, at least with, for me. Absolutely. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's interesting how you, you, from what I've heard from you so far, it seems like you resonate a lot with just being in the present um, quite often and, and, and just not setting goals, like not setting goals is my partner also does that. And he does very well. It's just like, Oh, just, I'm just going to follow my intuition at this moment. And, and I heard this, this, I think it was some Buddhist thing. And he said, uh, setting a goal with yourself is like a promise to yourself that you'll be unhappy until you achieve something. <laughs> and so we've oh, got all cool. these goals. We're just like in this constant state of unhappiness because- Yeah, that's goals. cool. Yeah. Cool. Um, I do wonder if just having a system is the best way and just like not a system necessarily, but just like following your, your, your heart every day is the best way. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. we do block ourselves a lot i think a lot of us are quite blocked um and sometimes it's because of something someone said i know for me it was like uh i didn't i didn't sing for a long time because of something someone said to me when i was a kid about not being able to sing and yeah. somehow there is this inner child in me that was just like oh well, that's, we don't do that now. We can't do that. And uh, I, mm -hmm. it took mm -hmm. a while and it's still, I'm, I'm still healing from it. Um, even then, even then, uh, I'm kind of going on a bit of a rant here, but a friend of mine yesterday, uh, I talked to her about how I'm blocked musically right now. And she said, don't say you're blocked, just say you're healing. There, that. <laughs> even that. <laughs> Correct. Like, Change yeah. your language. Yeah. I do that all the time i do that all the time because i catch it's like I'm, I'm perfect at this i catch myself and i go oh 
oh, I'm, I'm getting frustrated that I'm in traffic. And, and I go, okay, I, now I just said that. So I go, okay, hmm. instead of I'm frustrated at being in traffic, uh, I'll go, I'm learning to accept, I'm learning to accept that this is okay. You see? So it's like, I, I can still be in the same feeling or position, but I can change my perspective. You know what they say about, um, <laughs> this is interesting. Look, uh, I, don't, I don't have, this is not, this is one of those things that I was scrolling by on Facebook or whatever, and then you see it and then you log it. And I don't know how true it is. So please don't think that it's true, but I think it is um, one of those things which said, anxiety and excitement biologically is actually the same thing like what's happening in your brain when you feel anxiety is neurologically the same thing that's happening in your brain when you feel excitement the only thing that is different is your perception right the only thing that is different is how you perceive what is coming at you you see so i think that there's there's that which is what you're saying about yeah i can still have the same reaction but if i teach myself to see it in a different lens isn't that isn't that going to be a little bit more productive is that going to be a bit more to in alignment with what you truly want or desire you know yeah of course yeah is that your art in the background <laughs> no this is not my art um i did a artist in residency program with RAC um, and some students at a school. And it was a nine week program where all of the students uh, were invited, all the Aboriginal kids were invited to come in and I was teaching them. This is one of those rare times where both my art world and my teaching world will overlap. So I was teaching art and in a sense, the project was for nine weeks, I'll come to the school every Friday and we will come up with, it, it, all the individuals will come up with their own piece their own their own painting basically so this is a result of one of my students um beautiful nine weeks worth of um um painting and creation um and uh, it's just one of those things i just uh, i'm like oh, it's such a good background i'll just chuck it in there like i've got another one as well like this was from another one of my students as well these wow. are all dots these are all individual dots, right? Oh so um, nine weeks of that. And, he, you know, he, he had a little bit of help. He brought his cousin in and I, I, I chucked in a couple of dots in there myself. But I'm so incredibly proud of these Kulingars. We say Kulingars for young, for young people um, because of, you know, it was just such a funny and interesting experience uh, because nobody really expected them to come up with what they did in that amount of time. And it was, yeah, it was brilliant. So now I'm just like... I've just got them as pictures. So technically you're really just seeing a picture of the of the art. But yeah, not mine. Are, are you allowed to say their names? Are they are they still too young? These guys, I mean, they seem- Yeah, like probably, probably, right? It's one of those things where it's, uh, where it would probably, um, plus I don't know if they'd, they'd want me to say their names. So yeah. yeah. Enough, fair enough. But they were, so they were, these ones were in year nine, I think. So this one, this young fella here, I think it was in year nine or possibly year 10, I think, I'm sorry. Um, and the other, the other girl was in year nine or 10 as well. So that's about 15 years old. I just have a future. I mean, mm. this is incredible to stare at. I'm still, yes. I'm still watching it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It's like a pattern you'd see in nature, almost like seashells or something. Yeah. It's like Fibonacci. Like it's, mm. yeah. So you, uh, you hang out with them every Friday and, and do art. Do you like, what does that entail? What, what kind of. Yeah, hmm. that was just that was that was only for the beginning of the year. So that was a that was a contract that I got with RAC. And RAC was the, the client, and they were hosting me to come. They were paying me to go into that school with the relationship that they had with that school. Um, and then it was every it was every week uh, for nine weeks with a couple of breaks because there was you know COVID things and like you know so really it was like fourteen or thirteen or fourteen weeks. Um, and it was also really funny because RAC was like. We will we will pick one of the winners and we will give them five hundred dollars um, as a as and to, to purchase their art and to hang on our uh, on our walls at RAC. What they found out uh, probably by about week eight was that RAC was in real time having to compete with the market because these the other one that I had up before that that girl I think somebody offered her like a grand. Right. So, and it was a beautiful um, business uh, exchange 
opportunity to realize that actually the value of art is so important. It goes beyond just this contract that we're doing here. If that's going to be, if you're going to put a dollar value on art, which is already difficult to do, but but it, it's it was almost like there was the opportunity of um of doing the artwork itself. But then there was the opportunity of actually understanding that there's a market for this and there's a business for this. So RAC had to go back to the drawing boards, bless them, and then go, okay, uh, we have to now like compete in real time with the actual market. And uh, they ended up, so I think they ended up, yeah, they ended up picking two, two winners, but they're all winners, but they just picked up two winners. And uh, they, in the, in the end, they also ended up just giving every student that, um, that did the that did the artwork a hundred dollars anyway. So it was just kind of a cool experience for everybody. That's a that's a great lesson to teach kids too. Like, oh, if you mm -hmm. if you work really hard on a project, uh, yeah, you can sell like you can be your own business. You can own your own business. That's what I do. Years old. That's what I do. <laughs> making money. That's what I tell these kids. I'm like, listen, man, I'm I'm just here because I want to be here. I'm not I am not working on behalf of anybody but me. Yeah. Right. And I would never want to be in a position where I'm not doing something I don't enjoy doing so you know and they found that out really quickly because their pieces were already so great all of them every one of them was so great that they were so proud of it and also it had an actual real inherent dollar value to the market and the market perspective what is RAC what is RAC yeah. road assistant road RAC, like the they tow your cars. Do you know? Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Do you know have what? I mean, I don't even know what they yeah. road assistant. Yeah. I don't even know what they stand for. It's just yeah. RAC. It's like ANZ, right? Like it's like RAC, RAC. Yeah, no, we have a different one in New South Wales. It's, Do you um, really? I just figured everybody had RAC, girl. RAC. No, I know that's insurance. Yeah, we do have a different one. I forget what it's called though. I have it. Yeah. It's Royal Automotive Club, or Royal Automobile Club. That sounds like right. a, fancy, a fancy car club. That does sound now that I've because like it's one of those things that you never you never know what the the actual acronym is for. Like yeah. nobody knows what the acronym of NADOC is. Do you know that? Oh, is it a secret? <laughs> but, but you know what NAD, but you know what NADOC is, right? I barely know what NADOC is now. Oh. I know. Some okay. Dumb but there's that too. So yeah, Royal, Royal, RAC is the Royal Automobile Club. <laughs> <laughs> it's an insurance, it's car insurance. Yeah. They're, they're beautiful, they're brilliant. What is NADOC? What do you, have you, well, what, what do you, you've never been to like a NADOC week or like a NADOC week event? I don't think I have, no. Huh. I guess, I guess I have to consider that I'm, this is my world, right? So I'm just surrounded by these terms and things all the time. So NADOC, so one of the questions uh, um, that I got in that Reddit AMA was like, what's like an Aboriginal day? that like you guys celebrate or like something that's very important, you know, like is it Australia day or is it a thing or is it a thing or is it a thing? And I was like, no, no, we got a whole week. We've got NADOC week. So NADOC week is a week of celebrations. NADOC week is a celebrations of Aboriginal cultures. Um, and it's like, if you just, uh, a lot of the times different cities and different planning organizations will do events for a week. And it might be like, all right, on day one, you know, uh, open to the community come on in yarning circles we got um we got uh we got an aboriginal band that's up playing we're welcome to country by Arnie so and so we got this we got this we got this um and then day two it might be like all right well day two there's like a cultural tour that we'll do here so usually businesses and organizations and schools will celebrate their aboriginal cultures through nadoc week which is a lot of fun um but uh yeah it's just it's just a week of celebrations really okay Wow, that's funny that I've never, I mean, I've heard of it. I just never, huh. I don't think we ever celebrated. In my school, I remember we had a really cool Aboriginal guy come in and talk about, I remember he talked about like teasing crocodiles and they would like uh, jump out of the way and stuff. He was oh, also yeah. doing dances and stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But that's the only time I can remember, remember doing anything Aboriginal in school. Like, yeah. You know? Yeah. And I went to a few different schools. Maybe I missed it. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. Um, it is funny because I've since I've been since I talked to you last, I was wondering like, oh, how do how does one actually learn about the Aboriginal community in like if you live in Sydney, what do you what do we yeah. do to to meet people and to like talk to people and stuff? Where's the information? <laughs> yeah, um, like, the information, but also just like hanging out with people. Like, how do you know I, if I want to go and make friends, what do I do? 
yeah listen but... you know what and that's a, that's a, that's such a good question and it's like oh, it's like first of all if you're looking for information like if you're if you're wondering about oh what is that word mean or like what is wajak or warajiri or ganigal or yora whatever it is it's like just do your natural research and i know that sounds like a cop-out answer but that's just what i do yeah. right I, we have a cultural i say in my training right we have a cultural advisor and that cultural advisor is uncle we call him uncle it's uncle google i just say go have a yarn with uncle <laughs> right yeah and then i'll make the joke i'll say by the way it's not auntie google because fellas will understand auntie is always right what I'm getting at here is that uncle, don't just click on that first link. Don't take him on his first word. Do a little bit of research. Just have a bit more time, you know, spend a little bit more time. So I Google stuff all the time. It helps me out even on a cultural level, right? There's always available information. Everything I teach, you can find on Google. You really can. Um, or not everything, but not most things. And then I say, like, what would just your natural approach be to meeting people anyway, right? Like, I'm sure, like, if you went to, if people, people are interested, um, a lot of Australians are interested in Aboriginal culture and don't really know where to start. And that's where I go, cool, we'll Google it first. But also when you get your NADOC weeks, just go go to an event and just go have a yarn with someone or like go hang out and, and meet some people. Like they'll they'll be probably more than happy to, to have yarns with you and meet you. Like like anybody's always interested in meeting new people and being social animals as we are. It's just like do your own natural way that you would do that. I'm sure that's probably the best way that you can uh, get into the culture of things, you know? Yeah, NADOC week. Okay, next time. There you go. I've got uh, some net up weeks up. That sounds super fun. Mm. Uh, do you know much about uh? Do you know much about foraging? I love. I guess you you're in Perth, so you're in a totally different environment than I am. But I love foraging. I love like finding, yeah, yeah, just eating, especially native stuff. Like um, uh, fig face just bloomed. Uh, I don't know if you know this yeah. near the near the sea. Do you ever do anything like that? I I. <laughs> I think I, I don't <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. and I get it right like it's a it's a again it's like oh cultural educator like uh men's roles women's roles hunting hunting gathering it's like nah listen man I'm, I'm as modern as they come man like you know it's it's like um uh I you know you hear the stories you hear the old the old people's stories about you know where to find the certain foods and like how to harvest and and uh and and cultivate those plants and those animals and that's really cool but I've never done it personally and I'd be lying if I told you I did <laughs> you don't all the culture man you just teach you teach the art and you teach it well clearly so hey. someone else is teaching foraging it's cool well I, I i offer my education to um from what i know from what i understand from what i know i'm not a professor i'm not i'm not i'm not a teacher that's the thing i'm not I'm, i don't have the piece of paper which i didn't go to uni i don't have the paper but i do have education i do have courage in, i do have knowledge from myself and my experience and if that helps and if that resonates with people then that's what i do does it help do you find that people have significant shifts after they've had a yarn with you well i like to think so um my my i always think that if i'm running a training or doing something with people um in my mind i'm like okay two things if you learned one new thing from me and if i made you smile if or if you if i made you a little bit happy then I've done my job, right? So like that, that, those are my two goals. It's just to teach something new to somebody that would be valuable to them, hopefully, but also to make people feel happy. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Just a good experience is huge, especially if you're like, if it's for some work thing that you have to do and you show up and you're expecting nothing and then you have a great day, like that's, that's awesome. <laughs> you know what's interesting? Um, uh, uh, what's interesting is that uh, people, so in, in the world of training and facilitating, here's the thing. People don't usually remember the things that you tell them. People remember the way you make them feel. Okay. It's like, I'll tell a story about my English teacher in year nine. And I'll tell you, like, I can't really remember even what she taught me like in terms of the information or I can't articulate it and, and refine it and remember it in a way where I go, Oh yeah, she taught me this, 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 but I can absolutely tell you the, the, the way she made me feel interested in the information, empowered in learning new things. And she had the biggest impact you see. So usually when it's training and facilitation, it's actually quite important. Yeah. The, the knowledge is important. The, the understanding, the, 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 
what you're teaching is important and it will likely be remembered in lots of different ways, but you can't really quantify that. But I think what has to complement it is making people feel like they're actually a part of the conversation or they're like actually want to happily be there. That's very important as well, because that's what people mostly will remember. Yeah, absolutely. That was one of the things that you, um, that you did a Reddit AMA, which is why I contacted you. And one of the things you said was like, I love challenging questions. There's no mm -hmm. wrong answers, things like that. I think, um, from my perspective, and this is just my perspective, it's not anyone else's, it doesn't need to be, but it's something like, I want to know more, but I'm, I have felt in the past, like I want to know more, but I'm slightly worried about like stepping over a line or like um, just asking the wrong thing or, you know, is it even my right to know these things yeah. to get involved? And it's like, and then you're yeah. so open and so, so kind. It, it's, yeah. Well, thank you, That's, I appreciate you feedback and um, like and the position you're in is kind of the position that like most Australians are in all the time and um, it makes sense there's always the fear it's the fear of saying the wrong thing it's the fear. and I think it, and it comes from a beautiful place right because I, I believe that most people just are coming from that place of curiosity and and would like to know more so they can connect to it more and I think ironically it's quite funny because again, I can only speak from my experience, but like most elders, like most of the old people, most of the Aboriginal community that I know personally are all very open to sharing what they are open to sharing. And they like that. And they love that. They love sharing culture. They're like, yeah, let me teach you this. Let me teach you this. Let me teach you this. There's always things like, you know, there's always sacred business and, and there's always this culture on the outside and there's culture on the inside. And you're not going to get to that culture on the inside, but the culture on the outside is kind of what I think most people are very interested and curious about. Um, and I think most of the time in my experience, Aboriginal people are actually really happy to share it. Of course, a lot of people aren't. Of course, a lot of people are like, they, they like to monopolize the culture or they like to um, they like to be possessive with it and conservative with it. It's like anything. It's like, of course, and that makes sense too, because <laughs> this is a culture that's been uh, um changed quite a lot in the last 200 years as opposed to in the last couple of tens of thousands of years so of course there are people that um will consider their culture and anybody trying to get into that or research or understand it as a threat because it has been a threat it's been there as well so it's just that this the spectrum exists of of sharing culture and learning culture and i think that it it if it, if it helps, I'm comfortable in sharing what I know. And I'm also, com but I, I also always got to preface it with people like, actually, you can ask me anything, please, right? That's, it's like, and don't feel like you, you have to hold back because I'm just blessed with a lot of tolerance apparently because I, nothing really offends me. And, um, and, and I would rather teach people things that they're really curious about as opposed to it just being in a space of like, oh, I'll just, I'll never ask about it. And it sort of masticizes and it masticizes or it, caught, it kind of, um, um, if you don't learn, you don't learn, you don't know. And that could be a bad thing. You know what I mean? So it's like, I think it's very important to actually communicate and to provide value and culture where I can, if that helps. Yeah. Um, I don't know precisely how to phrase this question, but where, where do you see the future of... I don't like the Aboriginal people are so grand, but like what, I guess one question that I really want to know is like, what can people do if they want to help out? Like, do, is there a great place to give money to, or like, can people volunteer their time somewhere? I mean, what, what, what do you think could use the most, where could we put our positive intentions and energy into? Oh, that's a really good question. It's a really good question. And there's so many different answers, which dart in my mind to like where I could go with this, um, whether I give you the general answer or like, what do I see? And, um, so hang on, I'm just sort of calculating how, cause this is the biggest question, right? This is one of the biggest questions. Um, what can people, what can people do? What can people do? On a general sense, I think the best thing that people can do is continue their curiosity in understanding each other as humans first. But let's not even use the labels of Australian and Aboriginal and thing. I think like the best thing that people can do straight away is just be 
curious about our connection as human beings. Okay, cool. We've established that. That's good. I would then encourage people to be curious and inquire about challenging themselves to change their beliefs, not change their belief systems, but encourage them to, to look through different lenses, through different lenses. Maybe is that country as a spirit? Maybe is that a lens of, um, um, of bias or removing my bias from this discussion or this conversation? Like changing perspectives always helps because um, anytime we see somebody who's different to us, whether that's I'm in black and you, in wh you are white or whether it's I'm Australian and you are Chinese or whether it's I'm an Eagle support supporter and you're a Dockers supporter. We do this all the time where we, we construct tribalism around our peoples, right? And I go, that's beautiful, it works well, but also how do we reframe our, uh, how do we reframe our, uh, perception to consider other people's points of view and their referencing of their culture and their traditions and their peoples right so once we do that we come a little bit more open to each other and then it's like then everything sort of becomes a little bit more easy because with that grows confidence and with confidence that's when people can start asking questions that um that that might be a little bit more dangerous to ask and it's like okay they might ask a question somebody might get offended by that that gets sh shot to shit whatever happens but at the same time you've learned something new in that space in that time right so i guess that's sort of answering your question of like how and what can people do better to connect with what aboriginal people and culture it's like just be yourself and 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 um, realize that we're all kind of humans and yeah I know that sounds like kind of woo woo and like kumbaya but no it actually kind of works well for me <laughs> and then your second question I guess which was well, actually that was your first question which is like where do I see the future of Australian and Aboriginal relations being that is almost an impossible answer uh, question to answer um, because I will only ever come at it through my my lens right I'm an optimist and like I would like to think that it's like you could say I'd like to think that um, actually everybody's going to be a lot more cooler to each other and a lot less resentful and a lot more unified I do believe that I actually know that that is a possibility and I think contextually we're actually doing really well right now and again it depends on what lens you look through because so many people will will go absolutely not there are so many problems and you're right there is so many problems there's so many but you're looking at it through that lens and i think about our old people and i think about where we have come from as a collective human species and a lot of the time i have to be in the present moment of gratitude and realize that actually i'm sitting in a house with electricity and an air conditioner on a hot day and my belly is full and that's enough for me to be grateful for right now and so I'm going to do more of that. And yeah, you can focus on the negative things and that's beautiful. And, and um, there's, there's value in, 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 in tackling those head on, but I'm going to do what I know, which is best, which is utilizing myself in the space of love and compassion for all people and all humanity as, as, as woo woo as that sounds, but I'm just rolling with that at this point because it seems to work so far. Beautiful. What do you think? Well, I think, I think if you're out there doing what you're doing, then we're just going to keep getting better. I mean, there it is. It only takes, I mean, we think about, there are so many people out there and you only need a few pillars of the community to make giant, giant change. And maybe even only one. If you have one person who's out there and, and encouraging people to be compassionate yep. and understanding, yep. maybe that's all we need. Yeah. It takes courage. So if there's ever a word I'd be using, I think in this context is courage. It takes courage for the Australian to ask the question. It takes courage for the Aboriginal person to give it, right? So on both levels, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a level of courage that's needed to move past the fear of, of fear. <laughs> We're all just people. We have so much more in common than we do separately. Like, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. courage and look courage works all the time and it works well in ways that we don't even consider it like we should probably be a little bit more considerate of our own courage like it took you it took courage for you to reach out to me on a dm on reddit like that took courage because it's like i don't know you you don't know me there's there's like the fear of like why what if i'm wasting his time what if he's doing, what if like this is 
But that, that took courage and look what it created. This is a cool conversation. I'm enjoying myself. This is fun for me. I get to articulate my thing in a different way. And guess what? This is the third podcast I've ever done, right? The first one I did was like, the first one I did was like, um, I, I went into that podcast going, how do I speak in a podcast? <laughs> and I found that I was a little bit robotic and it was a little bit like, oh, I couldn't just be me. I was like, oh, this is on this person's platform. And I just got to like construct myself in a way which, and you know, it was, it was good. I had a good yarn with them and that was good. Um, but I was a little bit robotic. And I think the second podcast I did was um, a little bit similar. I was a little bit, I had a little bit more um, experience in talking and yarning, especially online. It was another Zoom one that I did. Um, and in that context, it was also a little bit better, but it was very specific to one subject. Um, and I was almost like just saying the same things that I would have said in um, my training, for example. And now it's this one where I'm going, oh, well, this is cool because it feels a lot more flexible and natural to actually do this. But I couldn't have arrived here without your courage. You see, I couldn't have done that without you doing that in the first place. So here we are. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your, your courageousness. <laughs> the least robotic podcast I've ever done. <laughs> this is like <laughs> super in the moment. Um, cool. How have you needed courage in your, in your life? How have I needed? How have I needed courage? How have I needed you courage? Realize courage? You said it takes a lot of courage, mm. and I wonder if there's an incident or a, a a step that you've taken in your life that's required courage. Um, I think everything takes a little bit of courage. Like it takes a little bit of courage to get up in the morning for some people. Mm. It takes a little bit of courage just to go outside. You know what I mean? Like sometimes people like the sun might burn them, or like, or maybe people are very anxious and they don't want to be seen or there's shame and it, i think that there's really just i love the i love the um what's that yin yang that's a that's a chinese the idea of that there's there's really just sort of fear and love and it's it's so it's all they're all manifestations of either fear or love that i'm kind of playing with that idea at the moment again um and and i think that well where am i aligned well i know where i'm aligned so what is in my way fear so how do i combat that courage maybe that's maybe that's a thing i don't know um that's the first time i'm saying it out loud so i mean if that if that makes sense everything is sort of a bit of courage it takes a bit of courage to reach out to me on reddit it takes a little bit of courage for me to accept that it takes a little bit of courage to was, hey you made an ama on reddit that was heaps of courage yeah there, yeah 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 there was there was that um yeah there was a bit of courage in in spending the time in answering those questions there's a bit of courage in mediating my that with my other schedule and everything else like it's all I think we're, we're actually a lot more courageous than we think because we don't acknowledge that we we do the courage, courageous things all the time just by being just by moving forward by going by doing things yeah it's a good question I've got to think about that a little bit more hmm. one one other thing is yeah so when somebody does overstep a cultural boundary and I don't know if you get triggered at all because I get fucking triggered not by this stuff but like for some reason, I won't even get into what triggers me, but I get triggered by stuff, right? And it's political mm -hmm. mostly, and I try to stay away from it. And oh. sometimes someone comes up with a viewpoint that I don't agree with, and then I get yeah. upset. And like, yep. I used to get angry and debate them, and now I just generally like, just yeah. don't talk or whatever. But I, how do you deal with it when somebody over yep. like steps, steps over a line? That's a great. I love that you asked that question because this is a question that I'm actually um reframing within myself a lot quite like right now um and i understand that there's 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 people that we agree with and there's people that we don't agree with there's there's the eagles and there's the dockers or there's the um i mean what's over there in the east you, you might don't even watch afl over there you guys more rugby people over there right no idea. <laughs> the rapidos um yeah whatever yeah. it is right it's like oh i'm i'm I play Fortnite and you play Minecraft and like now so we establish these we establish these these arbitrary sort of labels and belief systems around like which is right and here's the thing everybody's a narcissist and everybody thinks that they are right about everything and it makes sense in our minds so if I go okay I'm going to apply all these labels and be really intersectional about this and if I go okay well I am a labor person and uh, I believe in pro pro choice, or and I and I'm an Eagles fan, uh, and I so I'm constructing identity around myself, and it works for me, and it's beautiful, and it's great, and well done. 
And then you get confronted with somebody who has a different view. Okay, cool. But so you've got lots of elements that are at play. You've got somebody who's um, like, a, a, you got Labour and you've got Liberal, it's a Liberal bloke. And uh, uh, this person is, is, a, is a Chinese person, whatever, you got race thing in there. And it's like, oh, they're a, they're a um, Fremantle Dockers fan. And you, go, you kind of construct like, okay, well, you are not matching with me. Like your system is not matching with my system. And it's like, okay, remember, we're kind of all humans and yeah, all right, that, but you know, but I, we, we do this thing where we, 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 we alienate situations and, and ideas and conversations based on our bias, right? This is our bias and it's important to acknowledge our bias all the time. This is what I'm doing. I'm playing this interesting game with myself. I've been going and looking at um, conversations slash people that I know I don't agree with, that I actually one year ago, Reese would have been quite triggered by. I would be like, no, I don't like that person and that information and it's wrong. And I go, okay, now I'm playing this game where I go, every time I catch myself in that position, every time I go, this, oh, this is really annoying me. This is frustrating me, this person's position or their, or their ideas or their words. Every time I stop and I go, yes, I've accepted that. And, I, and it's not like I throw it away. I go, yeah, that's it. Then I say, and ask myself the question, let's reframe. I ask myself the question, what do I like about this person? That's a hard one. That's hard because all of me is going nothing. They're not good people. <laughs> but I go, what do I like about this person? Let's find something. And then some stuff starts to reveal itself, at least to me, it starts to reveal itself a little bit. And I'll go, actually, this person has a lot of courage because they're saying things online which are very controversial, that takes courage. I don't have to agree with it. I'm not saying I love this person just yet, but I am acknowledging there's something I'm connecting with this person. In this case, it's courage. What else do I like about this person? All right, I do like that they post all the time, right? Because I, I, I got a problem with that. I, I post like once a month and I've got to, so I'm like, this, this person's got a lot of momentum. I'm gonna, I'm acknowledge that I, now what's naturally happening when I reframe my intention of just being at odds or being in conflict with, is that I start to find this one little area where I go, okay, I like, you know what, we, yeah, I, I can acknowledge that. And again, I don't have to like that person, person straight away or even, um, or, or even agree with that person straight away. But what I can do is open myself up to the conversation within myself, really, of what it is that I like about them. Are you familiar with this person called Daryl Davis? Oh, yes. I love him. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Now, that is a master. That's a master at work. He has mastered this. And a lot of my thing comes from him. And for your for your listeners or your viewers who don't know who Daryl Davis is, um, I was listening to this Joe Rogan podcast. And Daryl Davis is this bloke who's this African-American fellow. He's a, um, he's a musician. And what he does, this is courage, right? What he does is he goes out of his way, he sits down with racist and i'm not talking about like i'm talking real i'm talking like kkk members like with the hoods and the robes and everything he goes and he talks to them that's courage and he goes and he sits down and he just has a conversation with them and what's happened and this is what he says there's this thing which people say they go oh daryl davis isn't that that guy that's converted like you know thousands of of kkk members like to 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 take to like throwing their robes in the bin and like, you know, becoming not racist. And what he says, he's like, no, 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 don't get it twisted. I am not converting anybody into anything. I am not telling them that they should or they should not be or understand who they are. What I am doing is I'm providing a conversation for them to get to know me a little bit better. And then they have come up to the natural conclusion themselves. And I'm like, well, that's it. Like, is that not it? Is that not what we're all doing here, right? So I go, in that case, if I'm alone and if I'm by myself and I'm not in direct conversation with somebody, but I am in direct conversation with myself and I scroll past that one person on Instagram who's a bit of a racist, then I'm just going to go, okay, I can, I'm disagreeing with this person, but as hard as it is, the challenge for me is I go, what do I like about it? That works for me or it's working for me at this point. I love that. Yeah. Hmm. Mm. It is the most courageous thing we can do is reach across the fence and just make friends with people or, or at least acknowledge them for their, their gifts. That's wonderful. I think so. I think so. Yeah. There's <laughs> something, I, I'm interested in cults and there's something about cults. I, I say cults, but really the, 
an abusive relationship has most of the same qualities as a cult and like multi-level marketing will have many of the same qualities and so we say cults but it's like there's a giant spectrum and yeah. one thing that they do is they oftentimes get people to get rid of all their friends and family who aren't in yep. the cult and then so it's like you know I, I'll only make friends with other Rapidos people there it's not a cult but it's like yeah. and and if you actually just just being friends with some, not not with the aim of converting or telling them what your political beliefs are or whatever. It's just like just being friends with people is oftentimes enough to just get them out of that mindset because it's it's not just their own little inner circle anymore. It's yeah, absolutely. And people don't know what they don't know. And also, I have this. I, I assume that every time I speak to somebody new, I assume that they know something that I don't know, and that's good because it's true. And that's exactly it. When you provide people with context as to at least, because here's the thing, it's like, I have a connection to you, right? So me and you are friends now, right? So I have a connection there. Now, if I was to um, give you some of my information for you to consider, not with the intention of converting, as you said, but just to consider, then you go away and you make your own natural decision of whether that resonates with your constructed belief system or not. And if it does, then we are going to be a little bit closer together. If it doesn't, then maybe we'll just stay the same. But maybe there's another conversation I can have that would not, again, not help convince you, but to at least plant a seed for you to consider. And then maybe there's another one. Maybe there's another one. And then I think at some point, like if everybody was really, really good at this, I'm thinking like planet Earth would be a much different place because we'd all kind of realize that it's all kind of arbitrary and it's all, we all create these labels for what to try to protect our belief systems and cultures and things and it's good like it has its value it's good but it also can be like this double-edged sword right whenever you put a label on something chinese australian aboriginal labor repertoes you you construct a you construct an eco chamber of 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 tribalism oh there you go the eco chamber of tribalism. I don't know if that, that made sense in my head, but you see what I mean? That's 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 what's happening, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. That makes wow. <laughs> eco chamber. Okay. Yeah. Just being open-minded with other people too is is really the best way to go. And and I think for me, there's something like they probably have good intentions, even if their intentions are wildly yep. misguided. Like yeah probably want the best for the world and yes even like it's fine that they're intellectually wrong but everyone is the hero of their own story too and so we have to treat them like the hero of their own story <laughs> <laughs> they're not a villain if they're sorry even if they like, might be in yeah yeah you're 100 and like in my ne- in like my next training or like in an idea that i have for like a, a like a solid part of my training is going to be titled this it's going to be titled actually comma everybody kind of wants the same thing right actually right so you're right you're right um actually everybody kind of wants the same thing so how do we get there strip away the labels at least for now and consider new consider new ideas and information removing those biases that's incredible okay i think i'm gonna wrap up um that was a a great place to wrap up um Before we go, uh, so everyone can find you on Instagram. And is there anywhere else where we could, like, if if a school, for instance, wants to wants to have you to teach kids art, uh, where, yeah. which every school should be doing, if anyone's listening here, uh, where can we find you? Well, so my Instagram is my is my fun place. That's just where I throw up my art and things and fun, and that's um, at the wholesome Yamaji, as I mentioned there. Um, if you're interested in my training, so if my acknowledgement of country training, which I call Acknowledge This, um, which is super exciting and like every, trust me, I promise you, every every aspect of what you consider an acknowledgement of country to be will be covered within two hours. Uh, we do public workshops every fortnight and we also do private workshops for businesses or organizations that want to do it internally. You can go to acknowledgethis.com.au um, to book, an, book a, a time with myself and Emma. So Emma is my, um, my, my sister, my co-facilitator. 
um, uh, uh, for a time um, with us there, if, it, if acknowledgement of country stuff resonates with you. Um, and then there's just my website, which is incredibly outdated and I, it's, I'm working on it and it's very old, but look, that's where you can get in contact with me with my email and stuff like that. That's just my name.com. It's Reese Paddock, R-H-Y-S-P-A-D-D-I-C-K.com. Um, and that's where you'll find me. Also LinkedIn. Like if you help, if you're a professional, if you want to be part of that professional mob, I'm, I'm, I'm finding that I'm like, I feel like I'm getting old now. I'm like, okay, I'm using Facebook almost never and LinkedIn all the time. I'm like, wow, I'm really in my career right now. So just my name on LinkedIn as well. <laughs> Great. Oh, it's actually good. I've got a weird sound. I'm on a farm right now. And so there's like a, but, oh yeah, but, um, LinkedIn's awesome. Like that's, I'm not a professional yeah. very much at all, but like, that's the place where you can find business people, like super successful people are on LinkedIn and you can it's just. All, it's hard. It's actually a good culture, right? It's, a, it's, it's like a, it's like a, productive and an empowering culture of professional individuals sometimes it comes at the costs of a bit of like a bit of like image like oh like oh la la look at me la di da but at the same time it's like it's it's a it's not like uh you know random shitty memes from like boomers and like facebook you know what i mean like it's not like minion memes and like, you, know, you know what i mean so it's just <laughs> a cool culture <laughs> yeah Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate your time so much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you for reaching out to me and being courageous enough to actually send me the DM. All right. I'll hope to see you soon. If you're ever in Sydney, let me know. I will. Yeah, cool. Likewise.